For the past two videos in this series, we've looked at how to design a road for any given wheel to roll smoothly on, and vice versa, and explored some of the strange but fascinating road wheel couples that emerge, such as how a square wheel, or any polygonal wheel, rolls smoothly on a road made up of a chain of upside-down catenary curves, or how an ellipse rolls smoothly on a sine wave, but only if its axle is located at a focus point, or how two identical parabolas can roll smoothly on each other. In this video, we'll extend what we learned to the case not where a wheel rolls on a road, but where you have a wheel rolling around another wheel, and see how to design the ideal partner wheel for a given source wheel so that they both roll smoothly around each other, while making some pretty cool other discoveries along the way, such as a wheel that rolls smoothly around a copy of itself, and how to generate other examples. Once again, I'll recommend you watch the previous episodes first, if you haven't yet, in order to get the best experience out of this one. I'll leave the links in the description. Okay then, let's jump in and get these wheels turning. Just like with the road and wheel problem, the first thing we need to do is decide what smooth rolling should mean. For a wheel rolling on a road, we decided that it rolls smoothly over that road if there's some point inside it, which we call the axle, whose path stays confined to a horizontal line as the wheel rolls. Taking this up to the case where a wheel is rolling around a stationary base wheel, the analogous rule would seem to be that the rolling wheel's axle stay confined to a circular path around the base wheel. One thing to note about this setup is that it actually doesn't matter which wheel we consider to be the rolling wheel versus the stationary wheel. Since if you switch your reference frame to that of the rolling wheel, the stationary wheel appears to roll around it in the opposite direction, with the old circle's center point becoming the axle that moves along a new circular path. In fact, if we start rotating whichever wheel is stationary in the opposite direction to the moving wheel so that their speeds match, the pair will spin in place resembling the motion of two meshed gears. However, as a quick side note, Although it looks similar, you probably shouldn't think of these coupled wheels as being exactly like meshed gears. This is because a lot more goes into gear design than simply getting them to roll smoothly over each other. As I understand it, since real gears are meant to transmit forces in a stable way, they're actually designed to not roll completely perfectly, and are actually supposed to slide against each other a little bit. So while wheels rolling on wheels may have some application to the problem of gear design, just know there's a lot more to it than just that. Anyway, the main draw of this topic for me is the interesting geometry that arises from studying wheels rolling on wheels, so that's what I'll focus on for the rest of the video. Alright, so we know what we want the wheels to do, now we need to describe each wheel curve mathematically. And like before, we'll do it parametrically, but this time, since both curves are meant to describe wheels, it seems logical to parametrize both of them in polar coordinates. That is, each wheel curve will be described in terms of a radius and angle function that depend on a parameter t, where the radius and angle you get for a given t value describes the current contact point of one wheel on the other, and where the origin corresponds to the axle point of each wheel within its own local coordinates. For this picture, I'll denote the radius and angle of the purple wheel with r and theta, like we had before, and denote the radius and angle of the green wheel with rho and phi. Now we just need to find a relationship between these two pairs of functions that will let us solve for one pair in terms of the other. And like before, we can do that using two observations about rolling. Back in the road wheel scenario, one of our observations was that the axle of a wheel and the road wheel contact point always lie along a vertical line if the wheel is rolling smoothly over the road. This fact fell out of a more general property of rolling that I called the orthogonal motion property, or pivot principle, which says that the direction of motion of a point attached to a rolling wheel is always perpendicular to the line currently connecting it to the road wheel contact point. Thus, since in a smooth roll, the axle always moves only horizontally, the line connecting the axle to the road wheel contact point must always be vertical. We can make a similar observation in the circular case. 
Since here, the axle of the moving wheel is always moving along a circular path, the line connecting the axle to the contact point must be perpendicular to that circle. But any line perpendicular to a circle is a radial line of the circle, meaning it passes through the circle's center, which in this case would be the axle of our stationary wheel. What this means is the axles of both wheels and the contact point between them must all lie on a single radial line of the circular path of travel of the moving wheel's axle, which means the radii of the two wheels at any moment must add up to the radius of that outer circle. If we take the radius of the outer circle to just be 1, we can state this mathematically as rho plus r equals 1. So we found a relationship between the two wheels' radius functions. Now we just need to find a similar relationship for the angle functions phi and theta. To do it, let's switch our reference frame back to where both wheels are spinning in sync like gears, and both axles are stationary. Since the two wheels are rolling on each other and not slipping, it must mean that at the point where they touch, both wheels are moving at the same speed. Otherwise, one wheel would outpace the other and would cause either a slip or a crash between them. But what is the speed of the wheels at the contact point? Well, like we computed in a previous episode, the speed of a point moving in a circle is equal to the rotation radius times the angular speed. In terms of our wheel functions, that would be the radius function times the derivative of the angle function. So rho times the derivative of phi for the one wheel, and r times the derivative of theta for the other. So setting these equal, we obtain a simple equation that relates the angle functions of the two wheels. Or, well, almost. Turns out we actually need to insert a negative sign on one of them, because although the two wheels' speeds match, they rotate in opposite directions, meaning the derivatives of theta and phi will have opposite signs. So we've constructed another pair of equations that we can use to solve for the shape of one wheel in terms of the other. To see how it works, and to, uh, sanity check ourselves, let's apply them to the boring case of a circular wheel. We know its partner should be just another circular wheel. Let's say we're starting with a circle of radius 1 fourth. We can represent it parametrically by setting the radius function r to the constant 1 fourth, and setting the angle function theta to be just t. So as t varies from 0 to 2 pi, we get a moving point that traces out the circle. Then the radius function rho of its partner must simply be 1 minus r, or 1 minus 1 fourth, or 3 fourths. Alright, makes sense so far. As for the partner's angle function phi, if we plug in what we have for rho, r, and theta into the second equation, we have that 3 fourths of the derivative of phi is equal to negative 1 fourth times the derivative of t, which is just 1 in this case. Solving for the derivative of phi, we get that it equals the constant negative one-third, and by integrating it, we get that phi is negative one-third t. Which should make sense, right? Since the partner wheel is three times bigger than the source wheel, it will have to spin three times slower to stay in sync with it. So these equations do seem to work. They enable us to determine the shape of the wheel that couples with a given wheel. So how about we call them the wheel coupling equations? Now let's turn to some more interesting wheel shapes and see what we can find. Also note that here on out, I'll be mostly just letting the computer generate the partner wheel shapes without showing all the underlying math on screen. But under the hood, it's these equations that are at work. How about we start things off with an elliptical wheel? If you remember from the previous video, if we place the wheel's axle at a focus point of the ellipse, the corresponding road it rolled smoothly on was a sine wave. So how about we do the same thing here? If we set the axle to be at a focus point, what do you think its partner wheel will be? Oh great, this again. Looks like we've once again hit upon the problem where the wheel we generate is a weird shape that doesn't close up on itself. What's this all about again? The issue comes up because the angle functions of two coupled wheels 
don't have to be in sync with each other. In fact, they usually aren't. If one wheel rotates by, say, 90 degrees, the other wheel doesn't have to also rotate by 90 degrees. Depending on the shape of its partner, it may rotate by pretty much any other angle. This is because the angle function of a wheel is dependent not only on the angle function of its partner, but also on its partner's radius function. The bigger its partner's radius becomes, the faster the wheel must rotate. So in the case of our elliptical wheel here, the problem is that when it rolls a full 360 degree cycle, its partner does not, causing the curve to not reconnect with itself after a cycle. Back in the road wheel scenario, the way to fix this was to move the road vertically up or down in order to get the angle span of the wheel after a road period to equal 2 pi radians, or an integer fraction of 2 pi. In this circular setting, we can do something similar by scaling our source wheel. The larger the source wheel, the larger the angle its partner covers in a cycle. And the smaller the source wheel, the smaller the angle span of its partner. So we just have to scale the source wheel to a point where its partner's angle span equals 2 pi, or an integer fraction of 2 pi, after a cycle. And depending on which fraction of 2 pi you target, you get a different shaped partner wheel for the same basic source wheel, which you can think of as different harmonics of the partner wheel. But if these are the harmonics of an elliptical wheel's partner, what do you suppose we get for the fundamental period of 2 pi? That's right! If you scale the source ellipse so that its partner's angle span is exactly 2 pi, you get an exact copy of the original ellipse. So an ellipse with its axle at a focus couples with itself. It's a self-coupling wheel. In fact, this works for any ellipse, no matter how round or elongated it is. The only requirement is that the long radius of the ellipse be equal to half the radius of the axle path. So just like how in the road wheel scenario, the road which was its own ideal wheel was a parabola, in this circular case, the self-coupling shape is an ellipse. But there's actually a marvelously beautiful connection between the two. You see, as you make an ellipse thinner and thinner, or to use the formal terminology, as you increase its eccentricity toward one, it starts to look more and more like a parabola near its ends. And so if I do this to our elliptical wheel couple while simultaneously zooming in on its axle point, both wheels start to look more and more like parabolas, and the circular axle path starts to look more and more like the straight horizontal axle path of the road wheel scenario. So in reality, the parabola-parabola road wheel pair is really just a special limiting case of the more general fact that an elliptical wheel couples with itself. Isn't that amazing? But this raises another interesting question. Are ellipses the only wheel shape that can couple with themselves? Or could there be other wheel shapes that self-couple? I mean, if we think of these coupled wheels as being similar to gears again, it seems like there should be plenty of other shapes that self-couple, just like how there are many different gear shapes that can mesh with themselves. But how can we find them? It's a tougher question than you might first think. At the moment, we can use the wheel coupling equations to find the partner wheel for any given source wheel, but if you just pick a random shape for the source wheel, its partner will almost certainly be wildly different. And even scaling the source wheel to generate harmonics of its partner is unlikely to help. So evidently, only very specially shaped wheels can self-couple. How can we find them? Turns out, there's actually a really simple solution for this. Almost insultingly simple. It's one of those solutions that seems so obvious after you've seen it, but in reality isn't all that obvious. It all hinges on an alternative way to generate a smooth rolling wheel couple. To see how it works, forget about getting wheels to roll on wheels for a moment, and go back to the linear road wheel scenario, and let's say we're trying to find the ideal road for this wheel. If you watched the previous episode, you know how this works. Given the parametric functions r of t and theta of t that describe the wheel, Plug them into the road wheel equations to solve for the road functions x of t and y of t. A bit of work, but not too hard to do, all things considered. 
But now here comes the trick. Think about what would happen if we used this road to generate a wheel on the bottom of the road instead of the top. This would correspond to taking our road, rotating it 180 degrees around, picking a new x-axis for the axle to travel on, and solving the road wheel equations backwards for a different r and theta. Doing this, and being careful to position the x-axis at the right spot to generate a closed wheel, we get a new wheel for the bottom side of the road which will actually couple with the wheel that rolls on the top. So to generate a self-coupling wheel pair, all you have to do is start with a road that is rotationally symmetric, meaning the road looks the same if you turn it upside down, and then the two wheels it generates for its top and bottom will be the same shape and will work as a wheel couple. And, of course, there's an infinite variety of rotationally symmetric road curves you can choose from leading to an infinite variety of self-coupling wheel pairs. Here are some of my favorites. You can even generate different wheel harmonics by widening the distance between the road curve and the axle paths, or equivalently, by resizing the road curve. Alright, as we wrap up this video, let's go back to where it all began and see what the partner wheel for a square is. I've actually already previewed it in previous episodes, so here it is again. But now that you know partner wheels can come in different harmonics, you can probably tell this one isn't the fundamental mode, since it has multiple repeated structures along its circumference. And indeed, if I enlarge the square wheel a bit, you can see that its fundamental partner is actually a heart-shaped curve. Aww, how lovely. But it's actually a lie. The classic heart-shaped curve of math is called a cardioid, and if you saw the previous episode, a cardioid was actually the ideal wheel shape for an upside-down cycloid road. But if you look closely, you can tell that the square's partner heart is not a cardioid. It's the cusp that gives it away. Here, the curve meets itself at a 90-degree angle, which makes sense, since it needs to accommodate the corner of the square, which is a 90-degree angle. But a true cardioid's cusp is formed at a zero-degree angle. The only thing that can fit in there is an infinitely thin spire, like what we had for the cycloid road. As a matter of fact, the cardioid's fundamental partner wheel is actually a teardrop-shaped curve. What the square's heart-like partner is really trying to be is a kind of spiral, which you can see if I extend the curve beyond its cusp. This spiral is the partner curve for a straight-line wheel extended beyond the corners of the square. So it's really just an accident of where the spiral's cutoffs occurred that made it look like a heart originally. As far as I know, this spiral is not one of the classic well-known spirals of geometry. It's certainly not a logarithmic spiral. It turns out it's quite a messy ordeal to calculate the exact shape of the spiral, so I won't go through it in detail, but after suffering through a lot of calculus and trigonometry, you can show that the spiral is described by the following polar equation, where the constants a and b refer to the coordinates of where the line intersects the unit circle in its own local coordinates. It's kind of a shame that the partner of a straight line wheel is such a mess. I was hoping for, and sort of expecting, a more elegant result. But what is kind of nice is that this formula involves Cauch, the hyperbolic cosine function, which seems a bit fitting since Cauch was also responsible for generating the catenary curve road that a square wheel rolled smoothly on. Kind of a nice callback, don't you think? And so with that, I think I'll call it a wrap for this video and this series, at least for the time being. We've come a long way since we first asked about the perfect road for a square wheel, haven't we? We've since found the ideal roads for other wheels, like polygons and ellipses. We saw how to do the reverse and find the ideal wheel for a given road or partner wheel, and saw that wheels can come in different harmonics depending on road depth or partner wheel size. We discovered there's a whole universe of self-coupling wheels, each generated by its own symmetric base road. 
and all of it powered by a relatively simple set of equations derived from a few simple observations about the geometry of rolling. If you've been here through it all, I just want to say thanks, truly, for coming on this ride with me. The series was a ton of work to make, but boy was it a ton of fun too, and I definitely learned an awful lot making it, as I hope you did watching it. So to end things off, I'll leave you with one last animation. A triangle wheel rolling on its ideal road that gradually transforms into a coke snowflake fractal. Enjoy! Thanks to Brilliant.org for supporting this video. Brilliant is an online learning platform specializing in teaching math and science interactively. They feature thousands of lessons with everything from high school algebra to multivariable calculus, along with science and computer science lessons, and have new content added every month. I think viewers of this video may especially enjoy their course on Beautiful Geometry, which covers a number of fun and interesting puzzles, such as how to efficiently place guards in a weirdly shaped art gallery so that there are no blind spots. But whatever your interests, if you're looking to learn new STEM skills or enhance your old ones, odds are good you'll find something on Brilliant that resonates with you. To sign up, go to brilliant.org slash morphocular, and the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thanks again to Brilliant, and I will see you all in the next video.